This is Voluminous, a listening books podcast for every kind of reader, but especially for fans of audiobooks. I'm Jessica Stone, and following on from the last episode's roundup of some of the many retellings of myths and fairy tales that we've been enjoying at Listening Books, today we're going to zero in on just one. And to do that, I am so excited to welcome the writer and broadcaster, Natalie Haynes, author of The Amber Fury, The Children of Jocasta, The Ancient Guide to Modern Life, and most importantly for our conversation today, the just published A Thousand Ships. Natalie, thank you so much for being here and congratulations thank on your you new so book. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it seems crazy that it's real. You know, it's in your head for so long and then you see it for real you know, but just on your own and you think, oh, okay, that's fine. And then you see it in other people's hands and you're like, oh, it's having an affair. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, just flaunting itself with another person. And now I'm just at the point of going, oh, yeah, no, it's a book. It's like, oh, yeah, it's like books, isn't it? It's a beautiful book it's as well. It's so lovely. Yeah, no, they have aced it. The cover is so gorgeous. The end papers are orange. The ships are golden. It is beautiful. It is It is stunning. Yeah. I had nothing to do with it, so I can boast quite happily about the cover. You just, <laughs> you've got no visual brain at all. I'm like, yeah, it looks beautiful. Thank you. Were you given any choices? Um, I told them they wanted to put a horse on the cover of Jocasta, and I told them they couldn't put a horse on it. Um, and in the end, uh, the horse was replaced with a... A sacrificial bull and I told them they could have a horse on this one because it's the Trojan War um, and then when I titled it A Thousand Ships they, I think they rather sadly took <laughs> the defeat on, on the chin and put ships on it instead They're so but they are so lovely and the week that they sent through the jacket um, art to me was the week that that um, Greek shipwreck was found uh, or oh. rather that it had been found before but the photographs were revealed and I think it was off the coast of Bulgaria I've forgotten now um, and uh it's 5th century BCE, so it's been there for two and a half thousand years oh, and it's wow. so beautifully preserved. It's too far down to have been looted. So the rowing benches were still there and the you know, hold hasn't been opened and it looked identical to the ones that they had put on here. And, you know, I sat in my flat and cried, of course, because that's Aww. what you do when you put everything into it. You're like, oh, it's so beautiful. But it looks like, you know, in Homer where he calls them beaked ships mm. um, and you think beaked okay and then you look at an actual you know vase painting of a Greek ship with these lovely kind of bird-like snout and yeah, you go yeah you they are beaked it, yeah. yeah so it looks like that I'm very happy oh you should be it's stunning and how long were you working on this book um, before that's a really good question I guess when did Jocasta come out? What year is this? I'm really good at ancient time. I'm really bad at modern time. So we're in 2019 and, now. I, know, I briefly didn't know which century we were in last year. And, it, and then I thought, that's terrible. And I thought, do you know what? Loads of people know. I could just ask someone. It's all right if I don't know. I know other stuff. It's not like I'm in charge of calendars. It doesn't matter if I don't know this. Um, I guess I must have started it when I was touring Jocasta. So I guess um, 2017. Is that right? Yeah, the beginning of 2017. And then I finished the first draft that October. So does that mean that you're already working on the next one then? Yeah, it does. Oh, wow. Yeah, the next one's non-fiction, so it's a lot less harrowing than this one. This was a very emotionally traumatic book to write at times because some of it is funny, but some of it's very sad. And so it was. there were days when it was very hard to switch between being you know, on stage performing fun and then coming back and murdering another person. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh. no, I can imagine. Um, and maybe that's, a, maybe that's a good place to start, actually, is because people will not have had a chance to have read the book yet for the most part sure. listening to this uh, since it is um, just out this month. But um, A Thousand Ships, it is a reimagining of the story of the Trojan War yes. and its aftermath from the perspectives of the women connected to it, both mortal and immortal. Right. When right? I sold it to um, Pan Macmillan, they bought it alongside Jocasta um, and they said, can you tell us sort of what it will be? And I said, yeah, there's going to be a sort of a, a, con a present tense kind of timeline in the middle, which is going to be the Trojan women after the fall of Troy, immediately after the fall of Troy. So they're on the beach, you know, their city is burning um, and everything that they've ever prized is being looted and divvied up from the invading Greeks. And then there's going to be a causation timeline that runs backwards and a consequences timeline that runs forwards and it'll change point of view every time. And they went, Okay. That doesn't sound complicated at all. <laughs> and I was like, I, I promise you it will work. And they're like, no, okay, that's fine. And they were incredibly trusting. And then, you know, a year later or whatever, um, then I gave them the first draft and they were like, yeah, no, that makes perfect. That's exactly yeah. how you said it would be. And so there are some recurring characters. The Trojan women come back. Um, Penelope writing to Odysseus, those kind of recur because obviously his adventure, his journey home um, takes 10 years. So she had so much to say. I didn't want to put her in a single chapter. I wanted to let her develop over time. Mm. Um, my, uh, one of my favourite things about those particular chapters is how her salutations and uh, sign-offs <laughs> change. They get crosser change. and crosser. I know. <laughs> 
<laughs> Get more and more peremptory. I know, yeah. She starts off my darling husband and then by the end she's like, oi. She's <laughs> so annoyed. You. <laughs> because he's gone for 10 years. And um, I had this fantastic conversation with a, a very lovely male friend um, who I've known for, God, 25 years, something like that. And he said, the thing with Penelope is she's so shirty. She's exactly the kind of girlfriend I used to have who would wait for me when I you know, said I'd go for a quick drink and then I was gone all evening. And then she'd be really cross and you'd think, I know she'll be cross, so I'll be even slower getting home. I'm like, but oh. you're still the one who lied to her. You're the one who said you were going for How am I on your side in this story? It's like, how are you not? And so, yeah, there, well, there you go. Yes. <laughs> yes. Clearly Team Penelope on this side. So I can see how like Penelope would be a given that you were going to include her as one yes. of the voices. How did you decide on the other cast members, hmm. so to speak? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I knew I wanted it to be Greeks and Trojans. I didn't want mm. it to be just, you know, one side or the other. Um, I wanted to tell the story. I wanted it to be epic. Mm. Um, I wanted it to tell the story of multiple women, all the women, rather than just, um, you know, Jocasta is a, is my tragedy. It's my version of of a Greek tragedy. And actually, the Amber Fury is a Greek tragedy too. It's the Oresteia. Um, and so they have quite tightly you know, wound casts and the plot's very, has that kind of inevitable ticking feeling. Of, yes. You know, Hitchcock at his uh, most, everyone gets to, everyone gets to, to die type um, <laughs> versions. And then with this, I wanted it to be an epic. So it had to have this huge number of voices. So it's like, it can't just be mortal women. It can't just be one or two mortal women. So it had to be the goddesses who caused the war. And it's not just the ones that you think you know. It's the ones kind of behind them and behind yes. them and behind them. And every time I kind of got to the cause, it's like you can take it back a step and back a step and back a step. And every time it's a goddess who's involved. And so I was like, this I, this is irresistible to me. Um, and then with the mortal women, um, I mean, I I have always wanted to retell the story of Hecabe, the mm. or Hecuba, sometimes people call her her Roman name, um, because it's such an extraordinary play by Euripides. Um, and of course it was in the time of Shakespeare, it was the, she was the most famous kind of woman in, in Greek tragedy, which is why Hamlet says, um, what's he to Hecuba? Ah, that's, that's why so the audience would have, have known. known it. Yeah, yeah, it was really, really popular. Um, and so she was, a, and then the, the kind of one-offs were the ones that were difficult. I knew I would do Clytemnestra because how could you not? Um, do you know who she reminded me of? Um, was Cersei in Game of Thrones. Ah, um, interesting. I wonder if that's not the he... incest <laughs> angle, but the... Um, but, not the incest. Yeah. You can tell I'm on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but the particular uh, quality that they both share of um, of sort of desiring... Uh, power but sort of scorning other women and their yes interesting for I did not watch Game of Thrones but I believe you yeah. um, but I wonder if that's his inspiration if um, the Oresteia is his inspiration because she's an extraordinary character Clytemnestra yeah. and actually it's one of those very rare occasions when the first play in the trilogy the Oresteia is called Agamemnon but Agamemnon's not the lead role Clytemnestra is the lead role mm. she has more to say so. oh yeah Agamemnon is so um, he comes across as so so petty that he that he's weak. Yes, well, that's yeah. that's exactly what we see in the Iliad. Um, yeah. I didn't have to invent that in book one of the Iliad. He is like an actual petulant toddler. Yes. Um, by is it book three maybe where he says, oh, "I'm going to test the Greek armies uh, by telling them we'll we'll pack up and go home," and they all go, "Oh, great, we'll go home." And he's just like, <gasps> not only is he too stupid to have seen this might happen, <laughs> but he has no idea kind of how to cope. He needs he's always having to bring in the help of other tribal leaders, people cleverer than him, like Odysseus, or right. more popular than him, like Achilles, yes. to get anything to happen. And he's then ungrateful. He knows that he's weak and he knows that he's stupid and he despises everybody who isn't because they make him feel like that. He is an appalling character. I wish I could say that this did not remind me of people... That you'd ever met. <laughs> or uh -oh. heard of or read about in the news. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, no, I'm afraid to say at the risk of uh, spoiling all over the place, but this story is, I guess, you know, well, the Trojan War in mythic terms happens in the 12th century BCE, but killing him was the... It was one of the happiest days. <laughs> Just going, yeah. oh, I'm going to have such a good day today. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, it was a delight. I can imagine that, yeah. And back to... <laughs> That's a that's a great thing to imagine um, is is an author coming to kill off one of their characters with with uh, glee, with glee. Yes. yeah because there are some terrible moments in this book that broke me when I yeah. you know wrote them and they broke me again when I read them for the audio book and then there are moments where you go oh hello <laughs> I've been building up to this one so yeah. yeah there were more fun murders and there were less fun murders to do definitely and fortunately the the really hard 
moments are kind of interspersed with a lot of lighter yes. and, and funnier moments. I'm I'm curious actually, how much of the humor do you think is is sort of inherent in the original text and how much of the humor is our modern eyes seeing that you know that this woman who doesn't get any any lines to say that she's definitely not accepting this without some sort of opinion. Yes. I'm not articulating this very well, but how much of it is no, definitely Penelope, there's no way she was that patient. Yeah, I mean, um, why would she be? Yeah. Why would she be so patient? He behaves appallingly. And there's that incredible moment where he goes down to the underworld in um, Odyssey 11, I think it is, and he sees his mother and he hasn't realised, Odysseus hasn't realised that his mother is dead. He's been gone for 10 years for the war and then, you know, I think we're about three or four years into his journey home, which will take another 10 years. Um, And so he sees his mother, who he doesn't realise has died, so he has this sort of terrible shock. And then he asks after his father, he (laughs) asks after his palace, he says, how's my kingship, how's my son? And it's like this massive after, it's like this sick thing, it's like, oh, how's my wife? And so just there's no way that my version of her is going to be just like, oh, Odysseus, of course you take everything so seriously and prioritise for everything. She's going to be like, wait, what? (laughs) You've done what now? Um, And so, yeah. Yeah, The dog is doing great. (laughs) (laughs) The dog is fine, by the way, getting older, but aren't we all? Yeah, no, that was a good day writing that too (laughs) but that's one of the most I I think it's a moment that British people especially really love in the Odyssey is that Odysseus goes away when his dog um, Argos is uh, not like the shop um, well spelled like the shop um, is a puppy and when he gets back 20 years later the dog is so ancient that it sort of literally manages to wag its tail and then it dies and it's it's British people are like oh my goodness the dog and you go yeah and also lots of people oh yeah (laughs) nation of animal lovers Yes, in a way, uh, slightly disproportionate. So, yeah, it, it was the dog had to make his appearance because he does get that fantastic cameo in the Odyssey. I couldn't resist it. Yeah. Um, I think one of the nice things about talking about a book like this, which is a, a retelling or reimagining of well known stories, is that we don't have to be quite so careful about spoilers. That I know, it's exciting, isn't it? it but then is, sometimes yeah. you kind of think, I'm not doing the Hecabee story. Um, when I'm doing the live show that goes with this mm. book because I don't think people generally know it. And it's so. It's so brilliant. You know, the Euripides play is so brilliant that I really want people to be surprised by it. Yeah. So, and then there are others like you know, I, and I did not see that coming or Laodamia, where I thought, well, these are pretty obscure characters. I think these are going to be a surprise to you when you find them. But, you know, and sometimes they're a character that we all know we know, like Helen. Yeah. Um, and and her ending for us isn't necessarily one we know. And in, in the end, I didn't put it in the book because it was so mad and I thought I can't just drop it in and I don't want to make a thing of it because it's not it just doesn't fit particularly well but in the Odyssey when Telemachus visits Sparta and he meets up with Menelaus and Helen um, we discovered that every night as, as far as we can tell that they talk about the Trojan War Menelaus gets very tearful thinking about his comrades that have fallen and Helen makes it better for him by drugging him and and so basically, she's but they spend the the last years of their marriage with her feeding him rohypnol every night. And it's like, well, I probably can't fit that in this novel, but it's at least as mad as anything that you could yeah. expect in a modern retelling. And it's right there in Homer. It's in one of the earliest versions of this story we'll ever have. Um, interestingly, you you chose not to spend a whole lot of time with Helen in this book. She doesn't get her own. She doesn't get her own chapter. No, chapter. she doesn't get her own ending. But she does get a chance she to gets point a moment, out, doesn't she? Yeah, she yeah. gets a chance to point out that she is not the only one at fault here. Like she is not the only one who left a spouse and a child. Um, you know that because that, this is the thing. You don't. I have been studying classics since I was eleven years old. I did um, Latin and Greek at GCSE. I did triple classics A levels. Didn't have any dinner money, really. Uh, I did a degree in classics. I taught classics and I've spoken about, written about classics for my almost entire career one way or another. And I didn't know until I came to write this book, I either did know and had forgotten or just had never known that when Paris and Helen elope, she leaves behind a husband, but he leaves behind a wife. Yeah. And you're, Wait, what? 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 And, uh, you know, there's a letter from... Oinoni, for that is her name, to Paris, I think in um, Ovid's collection. But either I hadn't read it or had just forgotten that I'd read it. And I thought, well, how have we just overlooked this incredible, how have I overlooked this incredible woman who does, you know, who deals with the exact same trauma and one of the abandoned spouses starts a war and the other one raises a son. And I thought the question that this book is raising, I hope, is which of those is is the heroic act. Mm. And I'm not sure it's starting a war, I've got to be honest with you. Quite. I wonder, could we have a reading now? You can. What would you like? um, I think, uh, since we were just talking about 
Paris and Helen who sort of kicked off the whole thing. But as your book demonstrates, there's always something behind that. There is. If we could go to um, the scene with the goddesses, uh, yes. Hera, Aphrodite and Athene. Yes. And I believe Eris has rolled a golden apple or a trinket of some sort yes. into their midst. So, yes. Um, I don't think we've found out yet, have we, where it's come from? So I don't need to give it any context. I've already done that in the book. Well done, me. <laughs> She was about to reach down and pick up the golden sphere, but Athene, always so sharp-eyed and grabby, snatched it first. Aphrodite had practically kicked it into her heel when she took the nectar cup. That's mine, Aphrodite said. Athene looked from left to right in mock innocence. I don't think so, she replied. It just rolled into my foot, so I think that makes it mine. Give it to me, said Aphrodite. Her mouth was set into a petulant line, but both goddesses knew that this was her starting point. In a moment, she could turn on the full force of her persuasion, and Athene would have to hand over the ball, no matter how much she tried to resist. No one could keep something from Aphrodite if she wanted it. No one except Hera. What are you two arguing about? she hissed. Athene has stolen my toy, Aphrodite said, and I demand its return. It isn't hers said Athene. It's mine. Someone threw it here at my feet. No one did anything of the kind. I dropped it and rolled it down the sand to you. That doesn't make it yours. Aphrodite turned to Hera. It doesn't make it hers, she said. Let me see. Hera reached for the ball and smirked as Athene's hand closed over it reflexively. I said to let me see it. Hera grabbed Athene's fist with both hands and prized the sphere from it. Athene tried to stop her, but as she was simultaneously trying to hold her spear, she could not. It's my ball, she said again. The other gods were beginning to notice that something was going on. Never averse to a good fight, they began to gather around. It's not a ball, Hera replied. Look, she held up a perfect golden apple. It was almost spherical, but widened towards the top beneath a tiny golden stalk. An indentation at the bottom allowed it to fit neatly between finger and thumb. It's still mine, Athene said. Something's written on it, said Hera, as she turned the apple in her hand. Tear Callista. I told you it was mine, Aphrodite shrugged. Who else could it possibly mean? There was a momentary pause. Perhaps it's mine, Hera said. Did either of you consider that? Give it back, said Athene. Papa! The gods looked around and eventually behind them to see the tall, bearded figure of Zeus walking quickly out of earshot. We can all see you sneaking off, Hera snapped. Zeus paused. A sigh shuddered through him. Somewhere, thunder grumbled in a cloudless sky and men ran to his temples to placate him. He turned back to face his wife. Did you have a question for me, he asked, or were you sorting things out among yourselves? Golden-haired Apollo nudged his sister Artemis in the ribs. These goddesses were incapable of agreeing on anything, and it provided them with endless enjoyment. This apple has the words, for the most beautiful, inscribed upon it, Hera explained. There is some debate over who it might belong to. There really isn't, said Aphrodite. There is, Athene said. There is only one answer to the conundrum, Hera spoke over them both. Someone must decide which of us should have it. She looked out over the sea of gods before her. Those who had pushed their way to the front of the crowd found themselves suddenly and bitterly regretful. They fixed their eyes on the ground as though each grain of sand must be counted. And that should really be you, husband, Hera continued. Zeus looked at his wife, her expression one of irritated entitlement, and his daughter a mask of plaintive injury. His other daughter was perfect as always, but only a fool would think that she expected him to choose either of the other two, or that she would forgive him if he did. It cannot be me, he said. How could I choose between my wife and daughters? No husband or father could do such a thing. Then give me my ball, said Aphrodite, her tiny shell-like teeth gritted. It's an apple, Athene said, and it's mine. How presumptuous you both are. Hera said, I'm holding it. Because you snatched it away from me, Athene cried. There was a shimmering, and the goddesses felt the sands shift beneath them. 
At Poseidon, the Earthshaker joined the debate. The gods were no longer crowded around them. Rather, they saw they were surrounded by bright cloud and then felt new, rockier ground beneath their feet. The cloud thinned and they found themselves on a hillside, dark green pines all around and above them. Where are we? asked Aphrodite. Mount Ida, I think, replied Athene as she looked around her and noticed the towers of a citadel across the plains beneath the mountain. Isn't that Troy? Hera shrugged. Who cared about Troy? Yeah, who cares about Troy? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you to read that because I wanted to hear you deliver that line that tickled me so much when I was first reading it that I laughed out loud. And that's when Aphrodite uh, responds to, um, there's some debate about who they belong to. <laughs> there really isn't. There really isn't. No, I love her confidence. The thing is, I think we've got so used to a sort of worldview in which women aren't ever allowed to just say, I'm tremendously attractive and you should all know it. And if they do, we're sort of, you know, scornful of them or we sort of deride them as being intrinsically lightweight and like an Instagram celebrity or something. And, you know, she's the most beautiful creature in, in yeah. the world and she knows it. And there was something absolutely... The gods were incredibly good fun to write. Eris is probably my favourite of them. But Aphrodite was fun. Athene is, you know, so... Grabby. I know. She's so <laughs> I <love her. laughs> clever and spiky and she's all elbows and she can't ever kind of... She just wants to be... You and know, you can't have her owl. <laughs> oh, you cannot have her owl. Doesn't matter what you do, I'm afraid. But yeah, writing some somebody who's just completely casually accepting of their own extraordinary power. There's something joyous about doing that and having that be a woman at the same time. You just go, oh, I'm allowed to do this. She can behave however she wants. She's a god. It doesn't yes. matter. Actually, that was really fun to read, um, not just with Aphrodite, but all the um, all the goddesses, including uh, Calliope or Calliope. And, yes. Uh, the who, muse. Yeah. Yes, the muse, who is also... Uh, very matter of fact about the way this works, you know, that, uh, yeah, I'll give you your, your poem when you give me that brooch. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Because it's always kind of, it's always bothered me a bit that the the general kind of translation of um, the first line of the Iliad, which in Greek is, menen aedathea peleiadio achilleos. Um, and it's almost always translated as sing muse of the wrath of Achilles. And the first word men in is wrath, from which we get the word mania, mad, mm. ruinous fury. Aeda is sing. Thea, not muse actually in this, but goddess. Um, and uh, the first line of the Odyssey calls her a muse, but, you know, presumably it's the same one, presumably it's still Calliope. Um, and then son of Peleus, Achilles. And it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of peremptory, isn't it? It's like yeah. sing muse. At least when it's Virgil, the first line of the Aeneid is uh, Arma Rewumque Carno, I sing of arms and the man. So Virgil's taking responsibility. Homer's just like, oi muse, give me my story. Right. And, and it's always vaguely bothered me. And I thought, well, imagine if she's there going, no, I don't feel like it today. You give me a present and then we'll talk about it. And that's obviously her mindset at the start of this book. Yeah. Well, also on the very... Yes. On the very first page, she asks, how much epic poetry does the world really need? Yes. And kind of follows that up with, is there really anything new to say? Yes. Um, and it struck me after reading this, because there's a there's a pattern as well of um, warnings being given primarily by women and those same warnings not being heeded. Yes. Primarily, but not exclusively by men. And it just struck me that although we're telling the same stories over and over again, we obviously need to keep hearing them because we aren't quite getting it yet. Yes. Still. <laughs> I think that's probably true. I mean, you're right, of course, about women giving warnings. Again, dates back right to, to the Iliad, where there are two... So I said there are two there are two people and one horse who give really good warnings in the Iliad. Andromache says to her Hector in book six, I think, uh, she says, you know, when you go out to fight, you know, don't go further than this. Don't overreach yourself, essentially. She says, you know, take care because I don't have a mother and father anymore because they've been killed. I don't have brothers anymore because they've been killed. And so you, Hector, my husband, you're my father, you're my mother, you're my brothers and, you know, you're my everything. And we've got to stand together. And it's good advice. And he ignores it or or over, overrides it, I suppose. 
And, you know, spoiler, he does get killed. Yeah. Um, when Patroclus goes into battle to fight Hector, Achilles says, do this, do that, but don't go any further than that. And he makes the exact same mistake that Hector will make. And the exact same thing happens. Um, and when Achilles goes into battle in book 19. So let's remind ourselves that the greatest hero in, you know, ancient literature, perhaps uh, the greatest warrior is Achilles. And he spends 19 books of the 24 books of the Iliad sulking, <laughs> not fighting, <laughs> you know, eating, cooking, hanging out with his friends, whining to his mum, playing his lyre. I have dated that boy. That is not. <laughs> a hero is all I'm saying. Um, but in book 19, when he goes all heroic, he's, he puts on his new armour. because His old armour has been stripped from the corpse of his lover slash friend uh, by Hector. And uh, his horse is granted Xanthus. His horse is granted this oracular power um, and, and the power of speech by Hera. Um, and the horse says, you know, we can, we'll do what, what, we, what we can for you. But if you go into battle, you know, you'll die. And Achilles makes that choice knowingly. It's worth bearing in mind that Briseis, the loss of whom is what provokes the wrath of Achilles in that first line of the of the Iliad, um, who is such an important character, therefore, in the plot, has 14 lines of dialogue in, in the Iliad, and they come in book 19, and Xanthus, the talking horse, has 10, <laughs> just to give you an idea. Wow. <laughs> so, so and we I do where see we stand. <laughs> talking horses are rare. I mean, don't get me wrong, he is a, it is an exciting moment. But yeah, women, 40% more interesting than a talking horse. That's that's the take-out statistic from this. Some some days I feel like I'll take it. <laughs> I know. It's like, well, if it has to be. But yeah, the reason to retell this story in particular, and from the, the perspectives of all these women in particular, is that we know the story, but we don't notice the women, that they... Yeah, you know, exist on the sidelines. You know, Penelope appears in the Odyssey and, you know, she deals with the suitors a bit and then withdraws and cries for a bit. And, you know, we hear from her quite a lot. The Odyssey is much better than the Iliad in terms of female representation. There was a satirical writer in the 19th century, Samuel Butler, who thought that, uh, who argued that the Odyssey must have been written by a woman because there were such mm. great roles for women in it. And the idea that men would write that seemed ludicrous to him. And, you know, obviously I wouldn't dream of surveying the current world of contemporary fiction as written by men and say, I simply don't know what you mean, Samuel Butler. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, there are these women exist in the story, but somebody like Euripides always makes women the focus. Seven yeah. of the eight plays he wrote about the Trojan War have women as their titles and and main characters um seven of eight i mean that's an extraordinary percentage but you don't get much you get more goddesses in the iliad but not very much mortal women yeah so in the last episode with the listening book staffers we kind of we talked about a theory that we didn't come up with it was a proper theory by some academic um that retellings of myths are addressing some lack yes. in the original some perceived lack and with this it's it's quite clear that we're addressing the the lack of of the women's voices. Right. Yeah. But I was wondering and I think you you may have partially answered the question already but are there classics that you wouldn't retell because they 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 have no lack they are already sort of perfect in themselves. I mean I never have done it and I would like to do it but I have not yet told and I don't know if there's a way for me to uh, Euripides' Medea, which mm. is my absolute favourite of his plays. It's my favourite play, full stop, actually. I wrote my dissertation on it. Um, mm. I don't have children, don't write in. Um, <laughs> and uh, I would love to, but I'm not sure. It's it's pretty much the most perfect thing as it is. So, yeah, maybe somebody will let me translate it for the stage one day and that would be lovely. But to rewrite it, I don't know. The The monologue that Medea delivers at the start of that play on the sort of terrible lot of women Mm. Written by a man, it's being performed by a man, remember, pretending to be a woman, to an audience almost certainly of just men. And it is so extraordinary on the subject of what women's lives are like and how limited they are that it was being read at suffrage meetings just over 100 years ago. It's like, well, you know, I think he might have just got that right. I, I think it might just be that no one can do anything with that. Yeah. So, yeah, I haven't... Although I suppose one thing you could do by by doing a rewrite is bring it to the attention of those of us who wouldn't occur to Yes, that's to true, to go and see that. it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, that's, maybe that's the reason for doing it. Because I probably see, I don't know, between one and two productions of Madeira a year. So I'm at, <laughs> I don't know, 20, 30. Um, and the most recent one I saw at the Barbican was just so, so brilliant. And they wrenched it up to date and made it, you know, this incredibly, uh, a production from Amsterdam. It was just incredible. And you go, oh God, there is, you know, that you can do something, you can change it and, and not, worsen it um, and it was yeah 
So maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I know a lot of people might know you from the BBC radio programme. Yes. Natalie Haynes stands up for the classics. Get your name in the title, it makes it harder to fire you. That's <laughs> yes. my advice. I think that's a great strategy. Yep. Um, I, however, first came across you at the London Literature Festival. That was my first encounter with, with you and your work. And you were interviewing Madeline Miller oh, and Charlene Tao. I was. Yes. yes. Um, and... To be perfectly honest, and, and actually at that point, I hadn't read any of their work right. either. So, you know, I just knew that it was about women rewriting Homer. And uh, and that sounded interesting to me. But I was prepared for it to be on the dry side of academic, <laughs> as, as really some of the wasn't. sessions I had already attended <laughs> had been. And it just turned out to be the most fun, most exuberant, both because of of the tone that you set on stage among the three of you but also i think it was it was really amazing the people who were in the audience there were a lot of young women yes. there who were so psyched yeah. to be there they were so excited they about Cersei, homer. Yeah. about homer yeah it's so brilliant <laughs> i just well, I kind of wonder, is that the most common misconception of the classics, that they're going to feel dry and academic rather than really exciting? Yes, and... I suppose so. I mean, I'm. it's hard in a way for me to say because I get, by definition, I get a disproportionate um, set of people coming to talk to me because the people who come to my live shows or read my books and email me or come to those kinds of shows that you were at or come to the recordings of the radio show or write in after the radio show are the people going classics are so cool so I am getting a very <laughs> so they're already on the team. heavily filtered <laughs> set of people but when Ancient Guide came out which was a non-fiction book I wrote about ancient history in the modern world and that was published in 2010 I think which I think is about 20 minutes ago but turns out to be nine years ago um I had lots of mail and I still do get mail from people who've who've read that for whom classics has been a, a sort of like a distant place that they, they were not allowed to get to. And often what has happened is they were at school quite a long time ago. Sometimes they are now retired um, and they were at school and they weren't put in the right set for doing Latin. They were deemed to not be clever enough. Um, and so they were put in a set to do something less as the school perceived as academically demanding. And then they always want, and Latin was always therefore kind of kept away from them. Mm. And, you know, sometimes people have spent their whole working lives with this terrible sense that they weren't good enough for classics. Ah. And it's like classics isn't, it doesn't belong to an elite. It belongs to all of us. It's it's all of ours. And it, it cracks my heart getting these mails and thinking that anybody was ever told that they weren't good enough, weren't clever enough. Weren't, it's, this isn't. This was a whole society. This is a whole culture. There is high art, if you like to think of it like that, and low art, if you like to think of it like that. There is tragedy and comedy. I don't have. I don't make those distinctions myself because I used to be a comedian and now I write tragedies and epic. So um, to me, there's, a, there's good art and bad art. It really doesn't matter where you're, you know, aiming it in terms of how many people you want to appeal to or that kind of thing. It's just snobbery. But the idea that people were ever made to feel like it wasn't theirs, it, it's, I, I mean, the radio series is an incredible opportunity for me to try and write that wrong um, because we get 1.6 million listeners an episode, which is you know, the the absolute joy and delight of, of being allowed to do it on Radio 4. And those people are as entitled to classics as any public school child who gets to, you know, who gets spoon fed it or force fed it, depending on your perspectives of such institutions, from, you know, the age of seven or eight or whatever. It, it's all of ours. A long, long time ago, I used to teach classics for a very lovely man who, um, when anyone asked about classics used to say that the house of western thought has many rooms but only one basement and i still love that <laughs> as a phrase um so yes that's how i feel it belongs to all of us it's all our foundations i love that um i think that might be a good place i started to get a little bit teary thinking about people being told <laughs> they weren't good enough for the classics as well it's so isn't it? i know so i need a i need another sort of comic moment so i'm wondering could we fit in one more reading yes um and this time i want penelope do you? Good I choice. want Penelope. <laughs> Which one do you want? Let's see. Towards the, it's one of her later ones. Yes. Oh yeah. Now we're at the point where she's not addressing him with anything nice. It's no, my yes. darling husband. And it's just Odysseus. Yes. She's got very cross. And here we are. This just gets better and better. Ten years waging war against one city with all the forces Greece could muster alongside you. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? And that is the most defensible part of your absence. Ten years of war, 
followed by three solid years wandering about the high seas, failing to come home with one excuse after another. You met a monster. You met a witch. Cannibals broke your ships. A whirlpool ate your friends. Telemachus himself would never have come up with such excuses, and he was a boy. Not any more, of course. Now he is twenty, a grown man in need of his own wife and child. In need of his own father, too, of course, but that rarely seems to occur to you. And now seven more years. Seven. Odysseus, can you even remember what that means? Twenty-eight more seasons, seven more harvests, boys grown to men, mothers dead, fathers ailing, with no word from you. But rest assured, and I'm sure you are having a very long rest, the bard has you covered. You are held captive, so he sings, on the island of Ogagir. Captive? I asked him the first time he sang this part of your story. Who holds him captive? What cruel jailer locks my husband away from the light and deprives him of a free man's liberty? What vicious tyrant, with what forces at his command, could imprison my poor Odysseus? To be fair to him, he did at least have the decency to look ashamed. It was no tyrant, he said. No man held you. This is starting to sound like one of your alibis, Odysseus. Who has blinded the Cyclops? No one. Who holds you captive? No one. Eventually... Under sustained questioning, he admitted that it is a woman who has taken you prisoner. A horrible old crone, I asked, who lives in a tumble-down old house in the woods and has adopted you as her son to chop firewood and hunt wild boar on which she can feast. No, came his shamefaced reply. A nymph. Of course it is. Calypso is her name, so I am told. No wonder he was trying to cover that up. She has, if the bard can be trusted on this, a delightful singing voice. Well, you always did like a tune, didn't you? Perhaps she minds you of those bird women you were so desperate to hear. Her island is in the middle of nowhere, far from Ithaca and far from everywhere. She lives in a large cave, which sounds practically bestial to me, but apparently she has a hearth and burns cedar logs for warmth and the homely scent. You used to have a home on Ithaca, of course, but perhaps our logs weren't quite up to your current standards. Her cave is surrounded by thick woodlands, apparently, which sounded so much like a euphemism when the bard first sang it that I threatened to have him flogged. He assured me he was describing nothing more vulgar than poplar and cypress trees home to owls and hawks and other birds. I can't decide whether he is laughing at me or not. It all sounds positively idyllic, as jails go, I mean, with a vine full of ripe grapes growing around the mouth of the cave and springs murmuring with fresh water bubbling up nearby. Meadows of parsley grow outside, dotted with violets, because I presume she likes the colour. Or perhaps she eats them, with your dalliances, Odysseus. It becomes increasingly hard to guess. And Calypso seems to have been the perfect hostess. So long as you overlook the part where you are, and it seems almost quaint that I still remember this, my husband and not hers. Poor Penelope. (laughs) She's getting so grumpy. But do you know what I love about her is how um, even when she is clearly furious, she is so self-contained. Yes. And still, like, you know, she just gets those barbs in. Yes. So pointed, but always just so clever and confident in herself. Yes. I think she occupies space really well. Mm. Um, And it's always kind of... It's always seemed to me that she she must be extraordinary because Odysseus is extraordinary. I mean, he's a terrible hero. That's just true. If you if you are part of Odysseus's gang of men, that is the most dangerous place to be in Greek myth because spoiler spoiler, he's the only one of his men who returns home in the Odyssey. Literally every other Ithacan is killed or lost at sea, or eaten, or something on the way home. He is not the person that you want to be standing next to, and. Still, though, he is this incredibly inventive, brilliant, kind of clever, spiky, sparky. You know, Athene adores him. She has an obsessive relationship with him in the Odyssey, in the Iliad. Um, and for me, too, she is, she's, you know, quietly fixated on him. And she's so clever. He is so clever. There's no way Penelope is boring. There's no way she's just sitting at home going, boo-hoo, poor me. Oh, do me a favour. What does he see in her? Remember, all the, the tribal leaders or princes or kings or whatever you want to call them vie for the hand of Helen, of Sparta as she then is, um, before she becomes Helen of Troy. And it's Odysseus who steps back and says, you know, whoever you give her to, the others have to, everyone has to swear an oath so that if someone takes her away, we all have to go and get her because otherwise there'll be war. And he doesn't, 
compete for Helen's hand and that he, he, his kind of price for coming up with this seemingly brilliant idea, although of course mm. it does call the, call the Trojan War, is Penelope. That's, mm. that's what he wants. And so, you know, what kind of man looks at the most beautiful woman in the world and thinks, I'd rather have her? Mm. And it's the kind of man who's drawn to somebody who is fascinating rather than beautiful. And I mean, Penelope may or may not be beautiful. It's simply not relevant, I don't think, particularly to um, what I have written about her. But she is smart and funny and clever and spiky. And I think that's what he saw in her. Yeah. Well, I think that's what I he love wants to come home to. <laughs> yeah, I love her too. I think she's great. Yeah, she was She was really, they were such fun chapters to write because I always knew, you know, even her last chapter, which I won't um, talk about because I don't want to spoil it, but even her last chapter when I knew she would be a little bit kind of shell-shocked by his return, even then I was like, oh, I'm going to miss you. <laughs> I'm going to miss having you in my heart. Oh my goodness, this reminds me. The one character that we haven't talked about, but you said in your afterword that you... That, that I miss you her the miss most. the most. And Cassandra. that's Cassandra. Yeah, I do miss her the most. And I she do. sort of epitomises that whole like warning... Yes, and being but not ignored. being heard. Yes. Yeah, and it is really interesting because I think the way that her name has kind of moved through language and time means that now if somebody's a Cassandra figure, we see them as essentially being very negative, hmm. um, probably mad, um, and somebody who who isn't heard. And actually, of course, she's completely sane. She's just cursed with this horrific. I mean, the 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 process during which she is cursed is horrific, um, and that genuinely was upsetting to write, um, where Apollo curses her. So I find this such an imaginative curse. I mean, it's a terrible curse. It is awful. But it's so creative, yes. isn't it? Yeah, so that the, you'll the see curse, the future, yes. but you'll never be believed. So he, he sentences her to this incredible isolation because forever, everyone she ever meets, she will know how they die. She will know what awful griefs will befall them before that. You know, who, which child will die, which parent will die. She knows everything terrible about you the second you meet her. So her heart is breaking the entire time whenever she meets anyone new and she can't say anything because they'll, in order to kind of cope with their own trauma, mm. they'll assume that she's insane. And so she's always thinking, she's always talking and she has to do it kind of quieter and quieter, whispering away just to herself because otherwise she gets in terrible trouble. Um, and sometimes gets hurt from it. Um, but she can always see what's coming and no one ever hears her. It is the most extravagantly unkind thing. I mean, there are some yeah. awful torments in, in Greek myth. And, you know, the ones that are the most famous to us are, you know, Sisyphus pushing a rock uh, right. up a hill in the underworld or Prometheus having his liver pecked out by an eagle every day. Um, and there, are, I don't think Cassandra's is really any any better than that it's just a no. total psychological destruction as opposed to physical that's the only difference really that there she is with all this awful knowledge and no one to talk to has it occurred to you reading about those sorts of curses what sort of curse you might devise and for what infractions <laughs> <laughs> have you ever given any thought to this <laughs> I, I try not to um yeah no i try not to it, it's been a difficult political time hasn't it, it has, the last few years. <laughs> i think it's really bad for me to wish people dead so i do try not to do it um oh that's so unimaginative as I well know, so because you, i think it's bad for my more... psychic space um but yeah no i like that i love that bit in the princess bride where he argues that humperdinck will be um They'll fight to the pain rather than to the death. Oh, and right. he explains what to the pain will mean. And so I think there's a lot to be said for... I mean, all my favourite characters in, in Greek myth, Hecabe does the same thing, of course, to the... Um, I'm not giving away this bit of the plot because I genuinely think people don't probably don't know it. Um, but when she punishes her great enemy, she does something which means that he will have to live with the awfulness yes. of his crime rather than making it all go away by killing him. And I think there is a great deal to be said. And the thing is, if you're the kind of person who's quite ethical or quite moral and thinks very hard about their choices and consequences and things like that, one of the most difficult things for this kind of person is to negotiate a world that has other kinds of people in it. Because I can't imagine what it's like to walk through the world and not feel responsible for everything that's gone wrong. <laughs> so, what is that like? <laughs> so, at least when I write a novel, I know I'm responsible for it. In the real world, I just feel like I'm responsible I for know. it. And the thing is that, so it's easy to think about, you know, bronze, the Bronze Age heroes and think that their world has little to do with our world. But when I think about how little I would have to swivel my head to see the braggadocio and the swaggering of petty, vain men in leadership positions. Yeah. 
Um, it's it's astonishingly contemporary, isn't it? Yes. Depressingly yes. so, let's be honest. Yes. But yes, and the, that kind of demagogic sense that the only important thing that matters is what you say and what you can claim that you can say. And the idea that your parentage, whatever it is, um, should decide your status rather than anything that you can do or can achieve is, yeah. I wish we'd moved on more than we have. Well... I am grateful that you have um, that you have written a book that has retold a story in a way that has allowed me to hear different things to to Good. hear yes to be able to relate it to um, to our current world and and sort of see how we're not listening to warnings yeah. now and I know there um, is that terrible sense of of thinking you know these all these warnings are we're still being told them and particularly mm. because at the time of recording. Um, Extinction Rebellion has has just finished their first set of of big yes. uh, protests in central London. Um, it's that thing. It's like how many how many young people standing up and yeah. bellowing at us do we need yeah. before we listen to them? This is ridiculous. Of course, that's the plot of Antigone of Sophocles Antigone, which I stole from my last book. Yeah. And then you know, there's the UN uh, resolution on um, sexual violence in conflict as well. It yes. could not be more relevant. Yeah, <laughs> let's water that down because you know it's not going anywhere, is it? No, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. UN yeah. resolution. I do see you needed to pass something, but not really enough. Thanks, though. I am aware that we've got to get you out of the studio so that you can get yes. to your next performance. But thank you again first for writing the book uh, that I very much pleasure. enjoyed. I'm so glad. Thank you. And uh, it will be out by the time you hear this. <laughs> and you can get it um, in hardback or audiobook and also ebook as yes. well, I'm assuming. Yes. All of those. Um, so look out for that. And if people want to know where you're doing the show that goes. Yes, the live show, this, which I have appallingly called Troy Story, for which I can only apologise. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. I didn't deserve it, but I'll take it. Um, I am touring it everywhere for at least the rest of this year. So um, I'll be uh, at Hay Festival at the end of May, oh, for amazing. example. Yeah. Um, so that's a good place to catch me. I'll be on tour. The tour dates will go up at my website, which is nataliehaynes.com. Uh, my publishers, um, who are Pan Macmillan, Mantle at Pan Macmillan, will have them up somewhere. Um, I have no doubt because they're on Twitter, even though I am not. Um, and I'll be in Australia and New Zealand in August. So people oh, wow. on the other side of the world, do not think that's enough to avoid me. It isn't. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and you're not on Twitter. Um, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter. I'm a refusenik. That seems like a good choice. It's just choice. me and Stuart Lee left now, I think. But that's excellent company to be in, so I'm fine with um, that. We, however, are on Twitter. And you can find us under the uh, Listening Books moniker, at Listening Books. Thank you very much for listening to Voluminous, produced by Listening Books, a UK charity providing audiobooks for people with an illness, physical or learning disability, or mental health condition which affects their ability to read, print, or hold a book. If that's you or someone you know, you can find out how to access our more than 8,000 titles and counting by heading to listening-books.org.uk. 